We are very pleased to be able to offer continuing education for a variety of professional groups as seen at the top of the slide. Free continuing education credits are available for this presentation through CDC's training and continuing education online system. Detailed instructions on CDC's CEUs are available at the website shown on the screen. That website is tceols.cdc.gov. Please note that the live activity number listed on the screen is only valid for those watching today's live webinar. You will need the course access code to receive credit. The archived activity number shown on the screen is to be used only by those who, who view the webinar recording later or attempt to access CEUs after July 8th, 2022. We are recording today's webinar and it will be posted on the CDC YouTube channel within a month for those who cannot join us today. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Felkner, NIOSH's Associate Director for Research Integration. Thank you, Nicole. Um, on behalf of NIOSH, I'd like to welcome everyone to our Summer Expanding Research Partnerships webinar, exploring how technological change is impacting work and well being from different perspectives. We're pleased to co sponsor this webinar today with the NIOSH Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Office. Today, we have an exciting panel of partners from occupational safety and health communities to consider the impacts of technological change with a focus on health disparities. And it is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished panel. I'll briefly introduce all speakers now so we can move more quickly between presentations. Please see the NIOSH Expanding Research Partnerships webpage for their full biographies. Our first speaker today will be Dr. Rashawn Roberts from NIOSH. Rashawn is the Associate Director for Diversity and Inclusion and the Director of the NIOSH Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Office established in 2021. Prior to assuming these roles, she was a researcher and scientific leader in NIOSH's Division of Applied Research and Technology. There she led research and dissemination projects covering a wide variety of content areas, including workplace discrimination, minority health and health disparities, aging and women's health. Our second speaker today is Eric Clinton from Unite Here Local 362. Eric is president of Unite Here Local 362, which represents 10,000 hospitality workers in Central Florida and South Carolina. Unite Here is a national labor organization representing 300,000 hotel, gaming, food service, and textile workers across North America, including the attractions and custodial cast members at Walt Disney World and food service workers in airports and industrial kitchens. Eric is also president of the Central Florida AFL-CIO, the umbrella group of organized labor, which represents 70,000 union members from over 50 local unions in the Central Florida area. And our third speaker today is Dr. Maria Espinola. Maria is the CEO of the Institute for Health Equity and Innovation in Cincinnati, Ohio. She has over 12 years of experience providing vision, leadership, and strategic planning for the development and implementation of health equity initiatives in multifaceted organizations. She's been a consultant for NIOSH and has also served on the Ohio Commission on Minority Health Medical Expert Panel, the University of Cincinnati President's Diversity Council, and the Health Policy Institute of Ohio's Board of Directors. And now we're ready to begin our webinar. Each speaker will have approximately 20 minutes followed by a question and answer session after all presentations have concluded. Please put your questions in the chat box at any time during the webinar. And now without further delay, I'd like to invite Rashawn Roberts to our virtual podium. Rashawn? Great, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Sarah Felkner for the introduction and Dr. Felkner and the NIOSH Office of Research Integration for coordinating today's session and for partnering with the NIOSH Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Office to sponsor it. Um, I'm also very grateful and honored to share the virtual stage with my esteemed co-panelists today. 
Um, some of the great strides we've seen in technological innovation have without a doubt opened up many new possibilities and avenues through which we can potentially protect the safety, health, and well-being of the U.S. labor force, uh, which is becoming more racially and ethnically diverse. Given that there are always two sides to every coin, however, I will be raising a few things to consider as even more possibilities for using technology to address occupational safety and health are discovered and what it might mean for racial and ethnic disparities and inequities. Next slide, please. But before I get started, I need to share this disclaimer, which is that the findings and conclusions in this presentation have not been formally disseminated by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health and should not be construed to represent any agency determination or policy. Next slide, please. So with that out of the way, this is a brief outline of my presentation. I will review the racial and ethnic uh, composition of the general US population and labor force, present patterns of employment by race and ethnicity, describe some documented occupational disparities and inequities in safety and health, and raise some considerations in using technology to address them and occupational safety and health in general. Next. So this slide describes where the US currently stands with respect to its racial and ethnic makeup. Uh, data from the 2020 US Census indicate that uh, about 62% of the population identifies themselves as non-Hispanic white. The largest ethnic group are those who self-identify as Hispanic, comprising 19% of the population. Further, non-Hispanic Blacks comprise 12%, Asian Americans comprise 6%, and American Indians and Alaska Natives comprise 1% of the population. Next. As you know, the US is expected to become even more diverse in the coming decades. And here are a few factors that will influence that increase in diversity. There are and will be growing numbers of Americans who identify as multiracial, and they are expected to comprise a greater share of the population by the year 2045. Other factors are that the Hispanic share of the population will continue to grow over time, and Asian Americans are the fastest growing racial and ethnic minority group. Next. To expand briefly on this final point, these are data on the growth of the Asian American population. The first figure here illustrates uh, that between the years of 2000 and 2010, the percent of Asian immigrants arriving to the US grew steadily, surpassing the arrival of immigrants of Hispanic origin around the year 2009. The second figure here illustrates the percentage change in the representation of racial and ethnic groups in the population between the years 2000 and 2019, with the greatest percentage change belonging to Asian Americans at 81%. So given this, by 2060, the Asian American population in the US is expected to exceed about 35 million people. Next. So with the expected growth of the Asian American population and other racial and ethnic minority groups, Blacks, Asians, Hispanics, and other groups are expected to com collectively comprise over 50% of the population by the year 2050. What this means in the realm of public health is that as the country undergoes this transition, the health and safety statistics of the nation will be increasingly influenced by the statistics of racial and ethnic minority groups. Next, please. And this is a concern because it is well documented that minorities in the US are affected by racial and ethnic health disparities and inequities. According to the CDC, the term health disparities refers to preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health 
that are experienced by populations that have been socially, economically, geographically, and environmentally disadvantaged. Health inequities are defined by CDC as particular types of health disparities that stem in particular from unfair or unjust systems, policies, and practices, and limit access to the opportunities and resources needed to live the healthiest life possible. Racism, for example, is a system or structure that affords less power and distributes fewer opportunities and limits access to health promoting and other resources to historically marginalized racial or ethnic groups and therefore contributes in significant ways to health inequities. Health disparities and inequities negatively impact everyone. They lead to worsened outcomes, not for just for the groups of people they directly affect, but also for those with more power and resources. For example, health disparities and inequities raise the cost of healthcare for everyone, and it diminishes wealth, uh, collective well being in a myriad of ways. So it's really incumbent upon those of us who work in public health to do what we can to promote health equity, which is defined by the CDC as a state in which everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their highest level of health. Next, please. To promote health equity across races and ethnicities and occupational safety and health per se, it's really important to understand the dynamics of the labor force, including its current racial and ethnic makeup. As of 2020, people of Hispanic ethnicity who may be of any race make up 18% of the total labor force. By detailed ethnicity, you can see here that the majority of Hispanics in the labor force self-identify as Mexican. Um, in terms of racial background, almost nine in 10 Hispanics in the labor force self-identify as white. Next slide, please. Given this, Hispanic and non-Hispanic whites together make up the majority of the labor force in terms of race at 77%, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics or BLS data. Hispanic and non-Hispanic Blacks and Asians constitute an additional 13 and 6% respectively. Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders account for less than half a percent of the labor force, and American Indians and Alaska Natives make up 1%, and people of two or more races make up 2% of the current labor force. Next slide, please. Rates of injury, illness, and mortality are influenced in part by the sectors and occupations in which people have the economic opportunities to be employed. Uh, most evidence suggests that members of minority populations face higher workplace injury risk compared to whites uh, because of patterns of employment by race um, and Hispanic ethnicity as shown on this slide. Uh, to summarize, relative to whites and Asians, Hispanics and Blacks are more likely to work in the production, transportation, and material moving occupations and in the service occupations and are less likely to work in the management and professional occupations. Relative to all other racial and ethnic groups, Hispanics are more likely to work in the natural resources, construction, and maintenance occupations. Next slide, please. Other BLS data indicates that, um, indicate that Hispanics are substantially overrepresented as painters and paper hangers, maids and housekeeping cleaners, and construction laborers. Blacks are overrepresented as home health aides, transit and inner city bus drivers, nursing assistants, corrections officers and jailers, and security guards and gaming surveillance officers. Asians are overrepresented as manicurists and pedicurists, software developers, computer programs, programmers and financial and investment analysts. And finally, whites are overrepresented as farmers, ranchers, and other agricultural managers, 
construction managers and wholesale and manufacturing sales representatives. Next slide. So now that we've reviewed these patterns, let's turn to exploring racial and ethnic differences in occupational safety and health. A recently published study used BLS injury data along with national survey data to test for differences between members of minority groups and non-Hispanic white workers in the risk of workplace injury, uh, which are defined um, or is defined in the study as injuries in the workplace that cost the employee at least one lost workday. The study found systematic disparities across racial and ethnic groups in the risk of workplace injuries. Um, if you look to the last column in the chart, non-Hispanic Black workers and foreign-born Hispanic workers worked in jobs with the highest injury risk on average, even after adjustments for education and sex. Um, these elevated levels of workplace injury risk led to a significant increase in the prevalence of work-related disabilities for non-Hispanic Black and foreign-born Hispanic workers. These findings in general illustrate how Blacks and Hispanics are positioned in the industries and occupations that expose them to increased risk of injury and disability. Now in this analysis, you will notice that Asians were found to have low workplace injury risk compared to other racial and ethnic groups. But this is not to suggest that there are not significant occupational safety and health equity concerns for Asian Americans. Next. For instance, their increasing risk for workplace fatality over time is one very important and significant concern. Uh, um, released in 2020, this 2015 to 2019 trend data from the BLS's annual Census of Fatal Occupational Injuries, or CFOI, showed the rate of death from workplace trauma increased by about 2% among white workers, 28% among black workers, 20% among Hispanic workers, and a staggering 59% among Asian American workers, which may in part reflect that they may be at disproportionate risk for fatalities due to workplace violence, um, particularly in the retail trade sector and to some extent in the services sector. Um, as the Asian American population continues to grow, so does the need to understand the distinct societal and economic issues this group faces, especially when it comes to worker safety, health and well being. Next, please. And beyond the realms of fatality and physical injury, more work is needed to understand the potential differential exposure to the psychosocial risk factors in the workplace, including and beyond those listed on this slide, and to understand the mechanisms through which these factors may help drive health disparities and inequities. Um, in the safety, health, and well being of Asian American and other racial and ethnic minority workers. And we obviously need to identify ways to intervene and to reduce disparities and inequities. Next. So that brings us to the use of technology. Um, it's widely understood that technology has great potential for preventing fatalities, injuries, and improving health and well being in general through facilitating a greater understanding of occupational safety and health risks and helping to mitigate those risks. For example, new forms of artificial intelligence or AI or various AI based technologies are being used to improve occupational safety and health surveillance, reduce exposures to various workplace risk factors, including harassment and violence, and provide early warnings of stress, health problems, and fatigue. Information gathered by AI-based technologies could also be used by organizations to identify psychosocial risks and to identify where occupational safety and health interventions are needed at the organizational level. 
Um, robots embedding AI can facilitate greater access to work for some workers and improve the quality of work by handing repetitive tasks to machines and altogether remove workers from hazardous situations. Next, please. But like there are benefits to using technology to improve worker safety, health, and well-being, there are drawbacks in that it may also have unintended adverse effects on and may even exacerbate disparities and inequities. Uh, one of the most obvious concerns is that the automation of tasks will lead to a sense of job instability and ultimately to employment for racial and ethnic groups who might be already very vulnerable to those risks. Also, AI has facilitated the emergence of new forms of monitoring and ma managing workers based on the collection of large amounts of real-time data. Uh, data can be collected about workers through mobile devices, wearable and, or embedded monitoring devices, or through other avenues during and outside of working hours in a variety of workplaces, as well as outside the workplace. All of this, of course, raises the risk of violating worker privacy. Uh, workers might feel that their privacy is being invaded, uh, which is not good for well being because that can be a source of anxiety and stress. Um, finally, data collected through AI systems may be used to inform management and make automated or semi automated decisions based on algorithms. Um, and this might enable employers not only to set finely tuned performance metrics, but to discipline and profile workers. Um, and it has been established that algorithms our algorithmic bias in AI systems can um, take on very forms of discrimination or result in discrimination, including racial and ethnic discrimination, which obviously would further exacerbate inequities in health, safety, and well being. Next slide, please. An important way to um, potentially reduce the adverse effects of technology um, is through partnerships and the use of engagement approaches with groups that advocate for workers, including for their safety, health, and well-being, and through partnering and engaging with diverse workers themselves. Uh, partners should be engaged to help identify and discuss the benefits and also look at the potential adverse effects of technology in question and how the collection of data should be balanced against the rights of workers to privacy and their safety and health. It's important to engage partners in all subsequent stages of the work, including technology selection, development, design, implementation, and use. Um, experimentation can be built into these stages where technologies can be tested so that the unintended adverse effects can be identified and addressed well before technologies are, ro are rolled out for official use. And transparency with partners should be a major part of engagement. Um, it's important to ensure transparency in collecting and, the, and using datas um, that are collected through occupational safety and health technologies. Next slide, please. So those are my two cents on this particular topic. Um, I will stop there and thank everyone for listening. Um, and my contact information is displayed if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Rashawn, for that really insightful discussion of health disparities, inequities, and equity, and how innovative technologies can be used to help address racial and ethnic occupational health disparities. And now we'd like to invite Eric Clinton to our virtual podium. Eric? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Clinton. I am the president of Unite Here Local 362. My local union represents 10,000 plus hospitality workers here in Central Florida, as well as South Carolina. Before I go any further, I'd like to thank Dr. Felcor and all of her colleagues at NIOSH for the invitation to participate and have this opportunity to uh, talk about uh, how hospitality workers are impacted with these types of changes. I'd also like to thank my uh, fellow panelists for their time and attention on these uh, very important topic. Um, 
the hospitality industry is on a fast track to implement technological changes in the workplace. Uh, this presentation will review the development and use of some new technologies in this sector and discuss their impact on the well-being of the workforce. The presentation will also address strategies employers can implement to mitigate some of the adverse effects of these technologies. Uh, my union is called Unite Here. Uh, we are an international organization that represents hospitality workers uh, in Canada, the United States, and Puerto Rico. Um, we represent hotel workers, casino workers, theme park workers, and food service workers in places like higher education universities, airports, stadiums, convention centers, and other industrial locations. The majority of Unite Here's members are women. They're people of color, immigrants, and generally English as a second language. Very important to establish that as we start to look at how technology impacts the hospitality industry. The types of technological changes we've seen in the hospitality industry vary widely. Uh, on your screen, you can see robot bartenders uh, or a uh, robot butler in a hotel, as well as a cell phone. And there are, there are many types of technology uh, efforts that have been and that are being implemented in our industry. Some of those are good and establish a safer workplace like a cell phone for a housekeeper who can hit a panic button if they are in a uh, dangerous situation. Uh, but there are also, uh, from our point of view, from the union's point of view, uh, negative technological changes that replace working people, that eliminate higher earning jobs, uh, that create efficiency measures that are unnecessary and that potentially impact how workers feel about their day-to-day -day jobs. Some of the disparities and inequities hospitality workers face have to do with language capabilities. Is the technological changes that are being implemented, are they being explained in a language that the worker understands? Are they being written in a language that the worker can read? Are they being trained in a language that uh, they fully understand? Uh, second is age. The hospitality industry is is really going to struggle over the next period of time with an aging workforce, a workforce that um, does not have a lot of young people coming into it uh, like they used to generationally ago, uh, and a large swath of the workforce that is going to be facing retirement soon. Um, an elder or an older workforce um, is resistant to some technological changes because of lots of different factors. Uh, technological changes can also have financial impacts uh, on, on Unite Here's membership or the general hospitality worker. This can be because a loss of hours. If a technological change is uh, an efficiency move, uh, potentially hours can be reduced or cut, uh, therefore uh, the hospitality worker not being able to work as much. As a result of that, the hospitality worker could lose benefits. Benefits like healthcare, retirement, paid time off. Uh, many of those uh, benefits are determined by how much you work and you must hit benefit thresholds or eligibility thresholds to be able to receive those. And for tipped employees in the hospitality industry, efficiency moves uh, can lead to the loss of wages or gratuities. Uh, many of our members who are uh, serving the general public and customers uh, rely on tips and gratuities uh, to be able to provide for their families. And finally, uh, a fourth inequity or disparity, disparity that could impact our membership would be the lack of job opportunities and or promotions and upward mobility. I'm going to uh, spend a little time now talking about a, a, a couple of specific examples. Uh, the first example that I want to explore is around uh, theme park custodial work. Uh, an employer implemented the use of cell phones and GPS tracking 
connected to sensors and trash cans and restrooms to assign work. What was the impact? Um, the work of this custodial group, uh, it's important to note, had always been done in two separate parts. Uh, one part was that of public work, uh, public custodial cleaning, like uh, changing trash cans and sweeping public streets or uh, wiping down benches, things of that nature. And a second uh, group of custodial work was done specifically focused on restroom cleaning. Uh, this employer implemented uh, uh, the use of iPhones and a uh, a system that that would inform and instruct workers to uh, clean a certain part of their workplace based on uh, sensors in restrooms and sensors in trash cans uh, going off. And so instead of an employee having a specific area that they were responsible for and generally cleaning, it turned into they could be floating to many different areas and based on their GPS coordinates, the sensors and the algorithm, the worker would be pinged to tell what to do. Uh, this was an efficiency move. Um, uh, there, there's no question that the employer in this case was trying to reduce hours of labor uh, by uh, making sure that custodial workers were assigned and needed to areas that needed to be cleaned. Um, however, the, the negative impact was that uh, the workforce felt like they were being watched uh, because of the GPS tracking on the cell phone. The employees lost ownership of their areas. If I'm the normal custodian in this part of the theme park, and I'm proud of having that clean a certain way every day, and now I'm not in that area every day, uh, my sense of pride at work and ownership of my work location has been impacted. Uh, language capabilities and training of the system became evident that the employer did not translate this information into uh, Spanish or Haitian Creole, which are the primary languages that spoke in Central Florida outside of English, uh, in particularly in the hospitality industry. And finally, there wasn't a common sense approach uh, with this technology used. And we'll have I have some recommendations at the end of this, but had the union been more involved with the implementation of this project, um, you know, understanding that there are certain parts of a workplace when you're responsible for cleaning, uh, especially with the high volume that would happen in a theme park, just have to be cleaned all the time, no matter what. Um, as a former custodian, custodial worker myself, the term hot trash can or hot can is, is fairly common amongst uh, custodial workers. And uh, what that means is it's a trash can that regardless of how busy the, the theme park is, it needs to be changed on a regular basis because there's just a high level of foot traffic. Um, having sensors in that trash can uh, were, were, were literally pointless because um, the, the employees had to change them before they could even be uh, told that they needed to be changed by this uh, system. But that is one example of how technology has uh, impacted hospitality workers uh, in, in our industry. Uh, a second example I'd like to explore is around uh, gratuities. Um, you know, this, this uh, image that you see on the screen in front of you is um, a bar top menu with uh, a QR code um, that says, scan me for food and drink menus. Um, th this existed pre-pandemic, but uh, has very much become like the fad in uh, in restaurants, in particularly airport restaurants. Uh, and and somebody could be saying, well, why why do you care? Um, why do you care about QR codes uh, in in restaurants? And why do why do employers care? Um, employers care because this means that they're able to change the menu. Uh, uh, in a very nimble way. Um, they're also not a, having to be forced to print menus on a regular base, basis. And there's this un, 
unreal but perceived uh, idea that a QR code menu is safer than an actual physical menu. So why does the union care? Why do our members care about the use of QR codes? What is the impact? Well, it lesson in, in a in a hospitality industry where guest interaction, customer contact is critical for tipped earners and gratuity earners. Um, this limits the amount of interaction that a server or bartender could potentially have explaining the menu, um, talking about their favorite dish or making recommendations. It also could limit um, instant contact when uh, coming into the restaurant. The employer could operate with fewer servers because the expectation that a customer will sit down, utilize the QR code and order before they ever even speak to a human um, is, is very real. That impacts the amount of servers needed, but it also impacts the amount of the gratuities received. And, and the reason for that is because there's less interaction with uh, the server. In addition, it could also impact uh, alcohol verification. Um, it is very important that as a server, you are not uh, un in any way giving alcohol to people who are either overserved or uh, under the age. Uh, and there are also other food safeties like food allergies that a QR code menu and technology, while all of its intentions are probably good, uh, it is, it's not possible to verify a, a peanut allergy, for example, uh, when you're taking a customer's orders. So uh, one question to consider for, for everyone is how much of this is about changing the customer behavior for now, and how much of this is to change the customer behavior in the future? Uh, many large food service companies are making millions of dollars in investments, billions of dollars in investments uh, around technology as it relates to uh, college campuses and higher education, uh, whether that's um, robot butlers that uh, deliver uh, food and drink to uh, someone's dorm or classroom or even an autonomous cafeteria where there are no human beings working and you as a student or customer would go into the cafeteria, grab a pre-purchased sandwich or drink, uh, go to a uh, manless or personless uh, register and clock out and there's no human being working there. Uh, th these are methods that are being employed in uh, college universities and uh, we believe as an organization that while some of these changes are for the future or for, for now in the present, many of them are to inoculate a younger generation to uh, the expectation of lesser hospitality service. And so finally, I'll wrap up with um, our, my findings or, or our union's findings and best practices as it relates to how we mitigate or lessen um, the exposure to or the disparity and equity that impacts our members. We're not Luddites. We understand that technology is here and that there are good pieces of it. We also understand that there are bad pieces of it. Um, what we think matters in terms of its impact is working with the union around translation, working with the union around the implementation and how employees are trained and that workers are included in the process to determine how these changes are implemented. The, the members, uh, whether it's a housekeeper in a hotel or a theme park custodian, they're the ones doing the work each and every day and understand the nuances uh, and practical realities of, of what it's like to work in those high pressure environments. My union has negotiated and bargained into labor contracts standards around training in these moments, around pay if there's a loss of job or severance, notice to the union so that we can prepare and inform our members about the potential changes, what type of information the employer must provide to the union when, when coming up with these changes, and also how advancement opportunities could be dealt with. Because if, if technology does eliminate jobs, it is practically, it is, it is understandable to believe that um, repair of that technology could become a job 
And how is that being offered to the current food service worker versus someone else? Uh, that is my presentation for today. I look forward to any questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, for that important perspective of organized labor on how technology is really impacting workers in the hospitality sector. And now we'd like to invite Maria Spinola to join us at the virtual podium. Maria? Thank you very much, Dr. Fernar, for organizing and inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Roberts and Eric Clinton for your presentations. You touch on very great points, and I'm going to expand on some of those points. So, so my presentation will specifically focus on the positive impact that technological advances can have on the safety and health of vulnerable workers. I will focus specifically on workers whose vulnerability to injury and illness is higher due to both hazardous uh, working conditions and exposure to inequities. Those inequities include poverty, race, ethnicity. And I will also touch on strategies to reduce inequities. So due to time constraints, I picked two fields to discuss today at the beginning of the presentation. So those will be construction and agriculture. And then I will speak about strategies that can be used in any field. So I am going to talk about wearable sensing technology. And I cited this recent review on this issue. So um, wearable sensing technology is becoming extremely popular. I think the amount of users will reach or surpass this year 1 billion around the world. Many people in the audience probably are wearing a watch that they are using to monitor health issues. So um, uh, some researchers have been looking at what, how can we use this to improve the safety and health of workers. So regarding construction specifically, and I, and I pick construction because one in five deaths among US workers is in the construction industry. So I think it's important to highlight what is going on here and what can we do to improve their safety. So some wearable sensing technology is being used to help uh, identify how workers are assessing hazard recognition, uh, hazards in construction sites. So um, there are different studies on this, but generally what they are looking at is eye tracking. So it's figuring out what is the visual pattern search that the workers are using when they're entering a site, how much time they're spending trying to recognize hazards, then how much they focus on specific issues, and then how broad is their search. So by figuring that, by looking at that, they can predict how safe that worker will be and they can identify training opportunities for them. The wearable sensing technology is also being used, as Dr. Roberts mentioned earlier, um, to evaluate fatigue. And in this case, for these specific devices, what they are looking at is physiological responses that can tell you when a worker is getting fatigued. And in construction specifically, this is crucial because we know that if a worker is getting tired, he's going, he or she is going to have difficulty recognizing dangerous situations, remembering tasks, and performing adequately. So monitor mental health is another issue that Dr. Roberts mentioned that I am very passionate about because I'm also a clinical psychologist. I, another reason why I pick construction is because uh, construction workers are basically the workers that have the highest suicide rate. And about over 80% of construction workers are reporting mental health issues. So this is a very serious concern in the field. And for these type of devices, what, how these devices are being used in this uh, review that I'm mentioning here is again, looking at physiological responses. 
Now, um, there, are other, there are other uses of technology that can also promote mental health that I will mention later. But in this case, it has to do with a cardiac activity, with oxygen consumption. So, um, and, and then, so there are different ways to measure it by using uh, devices that are placed on the wrist or um, placed on the head. Then um, the other huge issue in the construction field is preventing falls and preventing physical injuries. So mental health and back injuries are two leading causes of disability around the world. So very interesting research being that in, done in this area. And the way that they are using wearable sensing technology for this is that they are one, they are identifying where the workers are, are located, whether they are getting near a dangerous area. So that's one way of preventing uh, falls. Another one to prevent um, injuries is looking at their gait. So monitoring their gait, monitoring their movements and seeing if, so this can help people identify whether a worker maybe is abusing alcohol or is having some other issues, physical issues or mental concerns that are impairing his ability or her ability to move properly. Mm, so a huge issue around this area is identifying awkward postures and then add, so letting the worker know that, um, that that posture has to be corrected. Okay, so um, the other field that, I, that I'm going to mention is agriculture, like I said, and this is different use, it's a different use of technology. Drones can help in mapping and crop monitoring, a computer vision uh, via sensors and um, machine learning algorithms can process data captured from drones flying over fields. Using drones reduces the need for farm workers to be venturing to remote locations and robots reduce exposure to pesticides and extreme heat. So this is extremely important for, for, for the workers. So here are some numbers of what's going on. Um, there have been, so 385 million cases of pesticide poisoning per year reported around the world. 10,000 pesticide related fatalities per year also around the world. And farmers um, die of heat related illnesses at a rate that is 20 times greater than the rest of the U.S. civilian work, workforce. So it's extremely important to figure it out how to increase their safety. Now, um, there are wearable sensing technologies that can tell us if, um, if they're being exposed to high temperatures, dangerous levels of temperature. But uh, for this slide, what I focus on is on robots and drones. So robots are being used to, um, yeah, just uh, keeping farm, uh, keeping uh, workers safe. But as Ro Dr. Roberts mentioned earlier, yes, they are. They can take um, workers' jobs. They can replace them. And I will expand on that later on how to address that and how to make sure that workers find um, other ways to stay employed and actually make more money. So um, I will come back to this. Another extremely important issue when it comes to keeping workers safe is training. So um, actually I think it's over 60% of construction related injuries happen within the first year um, that the worker is actually in the site, right? So a really, really important information there to keep in mind, right? How fundamental, crucial training is. And as Eric mentioned, how extremely important it is to um, translate training materials. So in a prior presentation that I gave to Nayosh, I expanded on this. 
So we know that um, immigrants uh, from Latin America are 50% 50 50 more likely to die from deadly injuries. And some of the reasons for this include that they are not being trained at all. So that's one. Uh, another one is that they are trained, but poorly and not in the language they speak in. The other thing is that they might be trained in Spanish, but the words that they're being used in the training are not the words that they personally use. So an example that I give is personal. Um, so my father is a civil engineer and he has been in, in the US for about a year. So before doing my prior presentation to Nayosh, I asked him, I show him a picture of a forklift and I asked him, what is this? How do you call it? And he gave me a word that is the word that we use in Argentina, right? And I asked him if he ever heard of other words that I know Mexican, Mexican workers use and he wouldn't recognize it. So despite the fact that he has high education level, he lived in Latin America his entire life, working as an engineer for uh, 40 years, um, he couldn't recognize the word. Uh, and that's pretty fundamental because of the high level, high number of injuries that um, are caused by forklift. Okay, um, then uh, there are a lot of, uh, great things that are going on when it comes to using technology to improve in trainings. Simulators are pretty fascinating, in my opinion. I, have, I was looking at some where the workers will sit down um, and really uh, have kind of like the full experience of using this machinery, including like the impact or the shaking and um, using the brakes. It's just, it's just really, um, like a very, very uh, intense experience, training experience for them. Very helpful, very effective that can be done while keeping them completely safe right? in facilities away from, from everybody else. So um, that's really exciting. And the other thing is like, despite the fact that we both mentioned, Eric and I mentioned the issue of language that a lot of people are still not using technology give us this opportunity like it, it's not that difficult to actually create trainings that uh, in different languages and also engage workers beforehand to ensure that the words that you're using are the ones that they can understand also technology in many cases allow you to allow workers to repeat the training over and over, pause it, and ask questions, go back the next day, consult with others, as opposed to a one-person training um, that cannot be replicated. And mobile learning, of course, extremely helpful in terms of being able to allowing workers to take that information home and access it everywhere. Then there's also the case that Eric mentioned that people might be reluctant to use technology or you know, due to age or cultural issues. And that is a, a really important issue that I think can partly be addressed in, in someone in the audience already mentioned this with community health workers and I'll talk about that. Oh, hold on. So community health workers are lay members of the community who connect vulnerable individuals to health information, resources, and services. So they can be extremely helpful when it comes to promoting a number of health issues. So using, so there, there's a lot of research on uh, community health workers working on different issues without technology that, that has been in place for many, many years. Then there's um, another um, you know, large number of, re of research studies that focus on community health workers who use mobile technology to pretty much improve the range and quality of services. It also can allow them to take on complicated tasks and collect more accurate health data for research. 
So um, some of the studies that have been published are the areas where um, these workers have focused on include maternal and child health, HIV, hypertension, sexual and reproductive health, diabetes, asthma, cancer screenings. So community health workers integrating them in the model has been shown to be effective by in targeting all these issues. These, there is all, they have also been um, engaged in issues uh, about increasing um, worker safety. And I spoke about that in a prior presentation, particularly with the use of promotoras for the Latino community. And there is more information about this on the CDC website, if you search for community health workers or promoter, as you will see it. But the idea is that they can significantly help um, improve the communication that exists between the workers and health centers. And um, the other uh, great thing about it is that the community health workers are usually are usually members of the same community. So they oftentimes are familiar with the workers already or, or they know family members. Oftentimes they can go to the workers home and talk to family members there. So something that um, oftentimes happen is that well, men are notorious for sometimes not taking care of themselves, not going to the doctor as often as they need to. And I'm going to talk again about my father because like he, if he didn't have people pushing him to go to the doctor. So like, so that, that would be an example, right? Like sometimes a uh, targeting family members who would strongly encourage the person to, to go in and get medical screenings done and, and everything can be extremely effective. And sometimes it's the only thing that works really, so. So now I'm gonna talk about uh, technology, jobs. So as everybody knows, the number of jobs in technology have been increasing significantly. And it's so the, the trends are going up. This will continue to increase. And too many of these positions are being unfulfilled. We don't have enough people to take on, uh, to take and do those jobs. The wages are very high. So the median tech wages are 125% higher than median national wages. So a huge difference there. Very low diversity numbers here. So um, only 8% of uh, tech workers are black and 8% are Hispanics. Women are also significantly underrepresented in the tech industry. So that's why I'm bringing up these type of organizations. And I am not personally affiliated with any of them. Uh, but I just uh, would like to highlight some of them as examples of what is out there. So there are organizations that have been focusing on increasing the number of Black children in technology. And I'm, I'm very, so I'm, I'm very passionate about the idea of targeting children early on, right? So showing them the type of things that they can do in the future. So children are already <laughs> leaning to technology a lot, right? They are all um, wanting to use phones and, and computers. So they already are leaning towards technology, but these organizations are focusing more in helping them code and teaching them how to code and increase their career opportunities in the future. So some organizations are targeting the African-American community, other ones are focusing on the Latin, Latino community and both. So there are other organizations that are really interesting as well for veterans and spouses, for people who are unemployed, for refugees, one of the organizations mentioned here is it was specifically designed for coal miners. And I actually call them just to make sure uh, what they were doing was actually available for people. 
and they are based in Kentucky. And again, I'm not affiliated with any anybody here, but it caught my attention. And the reason for that they decided to do this, my understanding is, was the person who worked in the field for about 30 years. And then after seeing that uh, the employment in this field fell by 54% between 2005 and, two, and 2020. And um, they decide, so this person decided to partner with a foundation and develop this program, which trains former, former coal, uh, people in coal mines and others, uh, others who qualify to um, in, in robotics. So um, yeah, they train them in, in robotics. So that's pretty interesting, I think, and it has completely, so from what I'm understanding is it has completely changed lives and improved their, their career opportunities, obviously. And then um, other organizations that caught my attention have to do with uh, people, the organizations that specifically focus on prisoners. So female prisoners and male prisoners. So I personally worked in corrections before several years ago, but so um, I believe it's extremely important to, um, to create training programs for people who are incarcerated currently. Most of them will go back into the community. So, um, so in order to improve their health, their, their own safety and the safety of everybody, in the community, uh, I think it's key to provide them with proper opportunities to have decent wages and, and a future. Okay, so that was it for my presentation. I'd like to acknowledge Kamala Nelson, who is a research fellow with me, and Elsabeth Haley, who helped me prepare for this presentation. And then I'd like to thank everybody who attended. Here is my information and you can contact me by email or um, even schedule an appointment uh, using the website. Thank you. This has been a wonderful panel and what a great group of um, panelists. I wanna thank you all for your participation in this second installment of our Expanding Research Partnerships webinar series. We hope to see all of you at our next webinar series on uh, Wednesday, September 14th, when we're going to look at the impact of technology on work and well being through the lens of occupational health systems. Uh, to ensure you get the latest news about this webinar series, please visit the Expanding Research Partnerships webpage to receive email updates, and we'll put that web address in the chat box now. Now I'll turn it over to Nicole to close us out. Thank you all. All right. Thank you very much to our presenters and our audience for an interesting discussion. Some reminders as we wrap up today's webinar, the link for an online evaluation of today's webinar is available in the chat box. We also have the evaluation set to appear in the web browser when we disconnect the webinar. Lastly, tomorrow all attendees will receive a follow-up email with a survey link. Please take a moment to provide feedback on today's event. We use the evaluation feedback to improve our work our future webinar offerings. This webinar was recorded and will be posted on the CDC YouTube channel. Finally, as Sarah noted, the next webinar in this 2022 Expanding Research Partnership webinar series will be on September 14th. More information will be available on the NIOSH Expanding Research Partnerships website soon. Thank you and stay safe, everyone.